Good morning, everyone. This is Mark Erkin, and I want to welcome you again to our uh, Friday morning virtual um, thyroid journal club um, and educational program. It is, um, we have an outstanding presentation this morning, but before we get started, I do want to um, uh, let you know that there is another um, program coming up in October for the World Congress on Thyroid Cancer. Um, for those of you who attended in the past, um, you recognize that it's an um, incredible opportunity uh, to participate uh, remotely in that um, international uh, program. Um, and uh, for any of you who are interested in seeing what that full schedule is for Saturday, October 16th, you can um, certainly visit uh, the website and uh, the program is readily available at that time. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, the presentations on that day and encourage everybody um, to visit the website. Uh, this morning, um, we have an, an extremely uh, good fortune of um, being able to um, have Dr. Vivek Subaya, um, who is an associate professor in the Department of in in Investigational Cancer Therapeutics, at MD Anderson, he is also an associate professor in the Division of Pediatrics. He is the medical director of the Clinical Center for Targeted Therapy um, and executive director of cancer medicine research. Um, all of this is at MD Anderson. Um, his plate is incredibly full as he serves as the PI on over 50 um, phase one and two clinical trials. Um, his research emphasis is in drug development for rare cancers and um, uh, he has been the global PI for the Rare Oncology Agnostic Research Trial, known by the acronym of ROAR. Um, we have presented his work um, over the past uh, several months um, as it relates to uh, the use of dibrafenib and uh, trametinib in BRAF B600 mutant anaplastic thyroid cancer, um, which he uh, um, spearheaded. Um, at MD Anderson, and which ultimately led to FDA approval. This morning's presentation is going to be uh, related to the use of um, prasatinib um, for patients with red altered thyroid cancer and the work of a clinical trial um, that um, had the acronym of ARO. Um, so with that, it's truly a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sabaya. And as always, I'd like to encourage all of our listeners to send in their questions. Um, I will do my best to get to those by the end of the hour here. Um, so thank you once again for agreeing to present this morning. And Vivek, it's all, all yours here. Vivek, you're on mute. Uh, you know, thank you so much for the introduction. It's my you know, pleasure and honor to be on uh, the Tank uh, Foundation. Uh, you know, we uh, on behalf of the investigators, it's uh, a pleasure to present the Pralcetinib for patients with advanced uh, metastatic uh, retarded thyroid cancers. And thank you again for the uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Tank for the opportunity to present uh, this specific selective rate inhibitor pralcetinib for patients with advanced or metastatic retarded thyroid cancer. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, in this uh, presentation, uh, we will explore pralcetinib specifically in retarded thyroid cancers. I'll be uh, giving a brief introduction of RET. You know, I know you guys all know about RET. I don't need to talk about RET, but if there are any students or uh, fellows or residents listening to this, uh, just thought to give a brief overview of what is RET and what does it do as a receptor tyrosine kinase. Talking about uh, the basic uh, aspects of pralcetinib, the drug design, and pralcetinib specifically in medullary thyroid cancer and pralcetinib activity in red fusion parts of thyroid cancers. And towards the end, I'll be happy to take any questions. So, RET is a receptor tyrosine kinase. Uh, RET, rearranged during transfection, plays an important role, as you all know, in the development of kidney and nervous system. The proto in RET was first identified in 1985 by Takahashi as a, a transforming gene 
that was derived uh, by DNA rearrangement during transfection of mouth NIH333 uh, cells with human lymphoma DNA. Therefore, it was designated as rearranged during transfection RET. The RET gene encodes a receptor tyrosine kinase that contains a large extracellular domain, a transmembrane domain, and an intracellular kinase domain. Alterations in RET structure and function can lead to tumorigenesis. The RET ligands include the GDNF, which is the glial cell derived neurotrophic factor, the neuturin, the atomin, and the persephone, all belonging to the GDNF family ligands. These GDNF family ligands, also known as the GFLs, do not directly bind to RET and instead bind to GDNF family receptors alpha, the GFR alpha co receptors which recruit RET for dimerization. Subsequently, autophosphorylation on the intracellular tyrosine kinase residues of RET creates docking sites for downstream signaling adapters, leading to activation of multiple pathways. RET can be activated in cancer by two major mechanisms. One is through dimeric RET fusions, which are the chromosomal rearrangements, that gene fusions contain the kinase domain of the RET and gain of function missense uh, mutations, both in the e extracellular and the cytoplasmic regions of the RET protein. In addition to these mechanisms, uh, RET is also uh, activated by increased expression of wild type RET, and which has been linked to pathogenesis of several cancer types. Oncogenic RET alterations have been identified in multiple cancers. It was identified as an oncogene in 1985, and in 1993, it was identified in medullary thyroid cancer, in 1990, in papillary thyroid cancer. And in 2012, uh, it was RET fusions were identified in non small cell lung cancer. Again, the proto oncogene RET was identified, as I said earlier, in 19, just in 1985 by uh, the group from Takahashi. And, uh, you know, as that was derived by DNA rearrangement during transfection of mouse NIH T3 cells with human lymphoma DNA, therefore de being designated as RET. Okay, coming on to RET mutations in medullary thyroid cancer. You know, somatic RET mutations are seen in sporadic medullary thyroid cancer and among different multiple endocrine neoplasia. You know, again, several phenotypes are seen. The somatic frequencies of, of the somatic mutations uh, are derived from the cosmic database as shown here. The frequency of MEN2 are derived from pu several published studies, uh, including the uh, FMTC patients, the familial medullary thyroid cancer patients. So with this introduction, uh, moving on to our main topic of the day, pralcetinib, or also known as Blue 667. So what is pralcetinib? It has a high kinome selectivity for it. It's a highly potent and selective RET inhibitor that inhibits RET alterations and resistant mutations, including the gatekeeper B804 mutation while sparing the VEGFR2. Blue 667, as I said, selectively inhibits RET. You know, as we all know, multi-kinase inhibitors in the past were standard of care for advanced medullary thyroid cancer, like the cabozantinib and bandetinib, and radioactive iodine, uh, you know, refractory differentiated thyroid cancer, multi-kinase inhibitors like lenvatinib and sorafenib. Although these multi-kinase inhibitors have shown uh, very good clinical activity in, res in the respective indications, as we all know, they are associated with significant off-target toxicity like dermatological toxicity, cardiovascular toxicity, and gastrointestinal side effects, owing to their broad kinase profile. Again, activity against many kinases, including the VEGFR2. Again, these toxicities of these multi-kinase inhibitors led to frequent dose reduction, and also in the real world led to several drug discontinuations, which definitely affect the quality of life of patients with thyroid cancer. Procetinib, uh, formerly known as the Blue 667, uh, made by this company called Blueprint Medicines, is an oral a uh, once daily selective RET inhibitor that potently inhibits the RET altered kinases, including 
the gatekeeper alteration V804M and V804L, which are associated, as you know, with resistance with multiple tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Herein, we report the safety and efficacy of pralcetinib in red arterial thyroid cancer from the registrational, you know, phase one, two arrow trial, which formed the basis of approval of this drug in the USA for treatment of advanced or metastatic medullary thyroid cancer and red fusion positive thyroid cancers. So what is the arrow trial? The arrow trial is a first in human study with pralcetinib, which is a multi-center open label first in human phase one, two study. So the phase one study was designed with a Boeing design and patients received a dose starting from 30 milligrams, you know, and reached an MTD of 400 milligram once a day dosing. This convenient once a day dosing for patients has been, you know, noted to improve quality of life. Post the establishment of this maximum tolerated dose, currently there were several cohorts, including red altered thyroid, non-small cell lung cancer, and several cohorts with uh, thyroid cancer, including medullary thyroid cancer and red altered other cancers as well. So in the phase one study, we showed a steady state pharmacokinetics and also dose dependent exposure and red pathway inhibition. As you can see here, with inhibiting red downstream pathways, including the MEC, ERK, dual phosphate A6 and SPROUD4 mRNAs. And this was dose dependent. Again, it was also demonstrated uh, that dose-dependent decline was seen in the medullary thyroid cancer tumor markers in the carcinoembryonic antigen and calcitonin. Again, these were all dose-dependent. This was all seen in the dose escalation study. So in one of the first patients to enroll on this clinical tri trial, uh, let me uh, talk to you, share with you uh, one, a couple of my patients that enrolled early uh, in this study. This was a 27-year-old young man. Right? He had a huge neck mass that was invading his major vessels, including the internal carotid and the and internal jugular veins. Uh, in addition, you know, he had tumor invading the trachea and esophagus. Given the involvement of major vessels, you know, we, we were going back and forth in the multidisciplinary uh, team meeting. If the multi-kinase inhibitors like vandetinib and cabozantinib could be given. The challenge was there might be a blowout of the major vessels if he had a response uh, with these agents. Again, radiation was not an option given uh, the, the risk of tracheoesophageal fistula formation. So we knew that this patient's tumor uh, harbored, next gen sequencing showed that the tumor harbored the RET uh, L629 and D361 deletion. So based on this, we initiated uh, procetinib at a very low dose at 60 milligram once a day. Slow and steady, uh, the patient started improving. The tracheostomy tube that was placed could also come out once we hit 100 milligrams. And we escalated the dose from 60 to 100 milligrams to 190 milligrams to 200 milligrams and right now, he has achieved the recommended phase two dose at 400 milligrams, and we, which we could achieve within six months. And three and a half years out, he is still on this drug and is able to live a normal quality of life. Again, this drug undoubtedly conferred a clinical benefit uh, for this patient. And you know, we didn't see any of the untoward toxicities that we would see with multi-kinase inhibitors. So with this data, again, uh, this is another patient uh, showing a response in a vandertinib refractory patient. That was a treatment A patient, but this was a patient post vandertinib who also had a nice uh, a dramatic uh, response to a blue uh, 667 or pralcetinib. So pralcetinib has the potential to address unmet medical need across a broad range of tumor types. Again, as we see, recent tumor agnostic drug approvals have resulted in a paradigm shift in cancer treatment away from organ histology specific indications to biomarker guided tumor approaches. As a selective red inhibitor, a process in targeting red alterations that include fusions and mutations regardless of the tissue of origin 
And as we discussed earlier, the procedure of the biochemical IC50 for it was 0.4 nanomolar versus 35 nanomolar for Vega Far 2, making it specific and highly selective for activating red alterations and low affinity for other kinases. In fact, it is 84 uh, uh, fold, more 81 four fold, more selective for red than Vega Far 2 in a biochemical assay. So based on all this early phase, phase one clinical trial data, the ARROW trial was designed. The ARROW is a multi-center, open label, first in human clinical trial of tracetinib. The study is being done in 13 countries globally across 71 sites in the community and hospital settings. The first in human phase one portion established the maximum tolerated dose and the recommended phase two dose. The ongoing phase two portion of the study consisting of multiple expansion groups like red mutant medullary thyroid cancer with prior cabozantinib or vandertinib, red mutant medullary thyroid cancer with treatment naive patients, red mutant medullary thyroid cancer with prior systemic treatment other than cabozantinib and vandertinib and other red fusion positive thyroid cancers. The key primary endpoint was blinded independent central review an objective response rate and duration of response per resist version 1.1, in addition to safety. Patients with advanced solid tumors were enrolled and red alterations were based on local testing. Uh, patients should not have had any other co-occurring driver alterations and prostatinib was dosed at 400 milligram once a day. So this data was recently published in Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology with a commentary as well. So in the next set of slides, I will be presenting the data from this Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology paper. Red mutations, as you all know, are oncogenic drivers in medullary thyroid cancer and red fusions in multiple thyroid cancers. Red mutations are present in over 60% of medullary thyroid cancer and nearly universally in 100% of germline medullary thyroid cancers as a part of the MEN2 syndrome. As we all know, um, the multi-kinase inhibitors, cabozantinib and vandertinib, are approved treatment options for advanced medullary thyroid cancer. But these are approved without a biomarker and do have a high dose reduction and treatment discontinuation due, in, due to AEs. In differentiated thyroid cancer, which uh, as you all know, originates in the follicular cells, red fusions are present in approximately 10 to 20% of papillary thyroid cancer and less common, less than 10%, in other thyroid cancer types like the follicular, fertile cell, the polydifferentiated, and the anaplastic thyroid cancer. In lung cancer, the most common fusion partner is the KIF-5B followed by the CCDC6. And in patients with papillary thyroid cancer, the most common red fusion partner are the CCDC6 and the NCOA4. So in the dose escalation portion of the study, patients received prostatinib at doses from 30 to 600 milligram once daily. In the phase two expansion portion of the study, patients initiated prostatinib at a phase two dose. The recommended phase two dose was 400 milligram once daily. All patients received prostatinib until disease progression, intolerance, withdrawal of consent, or investigated discretion. The phase two primary endpoints were the proportion of patients achieving objective tumor response defined as a complete or partial response for resist version 1.1 as established by MAST independent central review in addition to safety. So between March 17th, uh, 2017 and March 22nd, 2020, at which that time the study was ongoing, a total of 587 patients were screened and 521 patients were enrolled on the clinical trial, of whom 147 patients had medullary thyroid cancer and 22 patients had red fusion positive thyroid cancer. As you can see in this trial profile flowchart, uh, a total of 142 patients had medullary thyroid cancer and red mutant medullary thyroid cancer was 122, or red fusion positive thyroid cancer was 20 initiated at recommended phase two dose of 400 milligram once daily. And these were the patients that were included in the safety analysis. The efficacy populations included 55 patients with red mutant medullary thyroid cancer, 
who received previously vandetinib or cabozantinib or both, 21 patients with measurable disease with no previous systemic treatment and nine patients with measurable disease with retrofusion positive thyroid cancer who had all received previous systemic treatment. So going to the next set of slides, which is the patient demographics, in the previous cabozantinib or vandetinib treatment group, there were 61 patients. In the no previous systemic treatment group, there were 23 patients. And the retrofusion positive thyroid cancer group, there were 11 patients. Again, median age was 58, 61, and 61 respectively. And there were 25% of patients in the treatment refractory group, in the MKI treatment refractory group, 25% of patients were above 65, and 43% of patients were above 65 years of age in the treatment naive group. And you know, 80% of the patients enrolled uh, in the prior MKI refractory group were white and ECOG PS, most of them had an ECOG PS of one, 67% had an ECOG PS of one. And you know, uh, early in the uh, clinical trial, patients with ECOG PS of two were included, uh, that included 5% of patients. And later in a protocol amendment, this was amended to include patients only with ECOG PS of one. Again, most of the patients had stage four or stage four A, B, C uh, at screening and 82%, 82 82% of patients had a sporadic uh, red mutation. So if you see the uh, fusion breakup uh, in the red fusion positive thyroid cancer cohort, 55% of patients harbored the CCDC6, and 18% uh, of patients had the NCOA4, uh, and we did not see any KIF5B that is the most common uh, fusion partner in non-small cell lung cancer. 8% of patients uh, in the treatment refractory group had a CNS metastasis, and 17% of patients had a, a CNS metastasis in the no uh, previous systemic therapy group. And 100% of patients um, in, 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 this, in this 11 patient data set in the red fusion positive thyroid cancer group uh, had radioactive iodine, and uh, several of them received multi-kinase inhibitors as well. Uh, the most common uh, primary uh, driver mutation was the RET M918T in 67% of patients. In the cystine-rich domain, uh, was seen in 23% of treatment refractory patients, and 3% of the patients enrolled had the gatekeeper alteration at screening. And the breakup of hereditary versus sporadic uh, RET mutation was 16 uh, versus 82% in the previous cabozantinib uh, uh, group and no previous systemic uh, treatment group was 48%. So moving on to the clinical response to plasitinib in patients with prior cabozantinib and or vandetinib treatment. The overall response rate in this treatment, MKI treatment refractory population was 60%. A total of 33, this was driven by a total of uh, 33 patients. There was one complete response, 32 partial responses, 18% with stable disease, uh, 18 patients, 18 patients with stable disease, that, that's 33% with stable disease, and 4% with progressive disease. The disease control rate uh, here was 93%, uh, and clinical benefit rate was 80. And first time to response was 3.7 months in this uh, patient cohort. As you can see, most of the patients harbored the M918T mutation, and a couple of patients harbored the B804M a gatekeeper mutation at screening, and several patients had the cystine-rich domain mutations, and patients who had both an M918T and a B804M mutations were also included in this uh, uh, data set. So paracetinib, is active uh, regardless of uh, the RET mutation in treatment refractory, MKI treatment refractory patients with medullary thyroid cancer. This shows, this waterfall plot shows the clinical response to pralcitinib in treatment naive patients who did not receive a multi-kinase inhibitor or any other treatment. Here, the response rate was 71% there was one patient who achieved a complete response. 
and 67% of patients achieved a partial response and 29% of patients achieved stable disease. The disease control rate here was 100%. The clinical benefit rate was 100%. And the median time to first response was 5.6 months. Median duration of response was not reached and the probability of a response at six months was 93% and at 12 months was 84%. So, prostatinib, as you can see, is active in treatment naive patients harboring different red mutations across all medullary thyroid cancers. This waterfall plot shows the clinical response to prostatinib in red fusion positive thyroid cancer. The overall response rate in this cohort was 89%. This was driven by eight partial responses and one stable disease. The disease control rate was 100% in this uh, subset. The clinical benefit rate was 89%. The median time to first response in this group was 1.9 months. And the median duration of response has not been reached because the patients are still on the clinical study. So as you can see, prostatinib shows an overall response rate of 60% in MKI refractory cohort, 71 patient, 71 percent in in the no previous systemic treatment cohort, and 89 percent across all red fusion positive thyroid cancer group. This shows the duration of response and progression free survival with prostatinib. The Kaplan-Meier estimate of the probability of ongoing response at six months was 96 percent and 12 months was 92%. The median progression-free survival was not reached with an estimated one-year progression-free survival rate of 75% after median follow-up 14.5 months. The median overall survival here was not reached and the estimated one-year overall survival rate was 89% after median follow-up of 16.5 months. Again, in this red mutant treatment naive cohort, the Kaplan-Meier estimates of probability of ongoing response was 93% and 12 months was 84%. The median progression free survival was not reached with an estimated one year progression uh, uh, free survival rate of 81% after median follow up of 15.1 months. The median overall survival was also not reached an estimated one year overall survival rate was 91% after median follow-up time of 18.5 months. This shows the duration of response and PFS in patients who are enrolled in the prostatinib arrow clinical trial who harbored the red fusion positive thyroid cancer cohort. In patients with red fusion positive thyroid cancer, the overall response rate was 89%, uh, eight of nine patients, all partial responses, Median time to first response, as I said earlier, was 1.9 months. Duration of response was not reached with a median follow-up of 9.5 months. The KM, the Kaplan-Meier estimates of the probability of ongoing response at six months were 100% and 12 months were 86%. Interestingly, the tumor shrinkage was observed in nine out of nine patients, 100% of patients. The median progression-free survival was also not reached with an estimated one-year progression-free survival of 81% .81 after a median follow-up of 12.9 months. The median overall survival was also not reached with an estimated one-year overall survival rate of 91% after a median follow-up of 15.8 months. Prostatinib uh, safety profile. Prostatinib was reasonably well tolerated. Most of the treatment-related AEs were primarily grade one or two and reversible. As you can see here, uh, patients had grade one to two increased aspartate aminotransferase, and 1% of patients had grade three uh, increased AST. Uh, asthenia was seen in 4% grade three of patients. 22% patients had one to two grade asthenia, and diarrhea was reported in three patients uh, grade three as you all know patients with medullary thyroid cancer present with diarrhea and you know again in personal experience you know, the patients who had 
a, a large number of bowel movements. You know, one of them I remember was 20 to 30 bowel movements a day. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it resolved within two weeks of initiating our pralcitinib treatment. Treatment related adverse events uh, leading to treatment discontinuation occurred in five patients anemia in two patients, pneumonia in one patient, and blood creatinine, uh, uh, CPK, the, the creatinine phosphokinase increase in one patient, and ARDS and pneumonitis in one patient. Again, there were uh, 6% deaths due to an adverse event, three due to disease progression, three due to pneumonia, and one due, due to uh, jugular vein thrombosis, and one due to respiratory failure. Again, one patient died owing to a treatment-related adverse event. Uh, in this case, the patient was diagnosed with interstitial pneumonitis on day 44 and later discontinued pralcitinib and also uh, was, was had, had treatment related pneumocystis urovecchi pneumonia. Um, and grade 3 uh, and above pneumonia of any cause occurred in 12% of patients. In summary, uh, in this phase 1 2 early phase arrow study in patients with advanced metastatic red mutant medullary thyroid cancer or red fusion positive thyroid cancer, pralcetinib at 400 milligram administered oral dose once daily showed rapid, potent, and durable clinical activity. Efficacy was maintained regardless of the red genotype of previous red treatment history and prostatin treatment was associated with a manageable uh, safety profile. The results of this study in patients with red mutant medullary thyroid cancer compared favorably with previously reported outcomes in patients with frontline standard of care multikinases, which as you know, the objective response rate with cabozantinib in actively progressing disease was 32% and 46% with vandatinib in patients with both actively progressing or not actively progressing disease. So what are the key takeaways uh, from this, uh, from this uh, publication? The key takeaways are pulsitinib, 400 milligrams administered once daily as an oral dose showed rapid, potent, and durable clinical activity. Efficacy was maintained regardless of red genotype or regardless of previous treatment history. So based on these observations, uh, we support pralcetinib as a poten potential therapeutic option for the primary treatment of red mutant medullary thyroid cancer and red fusion positive thyroid cancers. Based on this data, pralcetinib has been FDA approved in the USA as a once daily oral treatment for red mutant medullary thyroid cancer and red fusion positive thyroid cancer. Any study, and this study is not without limitations. The study limitations are, this was a first in human study, and this drug was achieved FDA approval based on the expansion um, of the phase one study, uh, phase one B, phase two study. And, you know, again, this is a single arm study and a non-comparative trial. Uh, determination of red genotype for enrollment of patients with red fusion positive tumor types was based on local testing and was not restricted to uh, central analysis by next-gen sequencing of plasma ctDNA or tumor tissue. Although uh, this received FDA approval, the findings presented here in this publication are interim analysis. As such, the median duration of responses, again, the median follow-up was approximately nine to 11 months, the progression-free survival with a median follow-up of 13 to 15 months and overall survival with a median follow-up of 16 to 19 months were not reached for any of the reported groups at the time of this data cutoff. However, there were high probabilities of ongoing response greater than 84% progression-free survival, um, ongoing greater than 84% ongoing response, greater than 75% progression-free survival, and overall survival of greater than 89% at 12 months in each of the subgroups, suggesting that pralcetinib has durable clinical activity. Again, one of the key strengths of this study is that the results are based on masked independent central radiology review of tumor assessments 
thereby eliminating any potential bias associated with local investigator assessments. In the next set of slides, I will uh, you know, share with you uh, a few of the patients that uh, we treated here at MD Anderson on, on this clinical trial. This was a 52-year-old male gastroenterologist with medullary thyroid cancer. In this case, um, uh, this uh, doctor uh, harbored uh, the germline RET V804 gatekeeper mutation with you know, patient presented with metastasis to the neck, made us, uh, lymph nodes, lungs, liver, and bone. Unfortunately, had progressive disease in the liver on sunitinib. You know, his AEs on sunitinib included anorexia, weight loss, diarrhea, hand foot syndrome, fatigue, you know, all the side effects that we see with multi-kinase inhibitors. Again, uh, this patient initiated blue uh, in the early part of the phase one study at 100 milligram BID. In the phase one uh, study, we tested both twice a day cohorts and once a day cohorts. And eventually we achieved the once a day 400 milligram flat, once a day convenient dosing. So in the BID cohort was initiated and then uh, eventually escalated to 400 milligram once a day at cycle three day one. By cycle five day one, right, we could see even in the first month, the patient's performance status rapidly improved. Uh, by cycle five day one, we achieved a partial response per resist version 1.1 with, as you can see, reduction in liver metastasis, gaining weight in, in within five cycles, he gained weight, the BMI increased from 18.9 to 23.5 and the patient had no diarrhea and he could go back to his full-time work. As you can see, even in these scans, his body mass index uh, increasing from baseline to five months. And in some uh, cases, uh, you know, uh, Prothetinib demonstrated potent rapid activity. And this was a patient with a huge liver mass that was avidly uh, FDG beta active. And you know this patient progressed on several MKIs, and the performance status was rapidly declining. And we initiated prostatinib at the 400 milligram, and immediately the patient uh, started feeling better within a week. And you know, uh, as you can see in the pre and post scans, the response was dramatic. Even the acidic fluid, uh, you know, uh, decreased to a large extent that the patient could go on to take care of her grandchildren. And again, this undoubtedly conferred uh, the, the quality of life uh, to this uh, grandma of, of several grandkids. This uh, is a young uh, adolescent and young adult female. Uh, this was a 23-year-old female with papillary thyroid cancer with the sclerosing variant. In this case, her tumor harbored the CCDC6 red fusion. Uh, she presented uh, six years ago with symptomatic diffuse lung metastasis requiring supplemental oxygen. And she required supplemental oxygen since diagnosis. Uh, she was treated with iodine-131 and received a total of 351 MCI with subsequent fibrosis. So her tumor had progressed on sorafenib and earlier on lenvatinib. And before enrolling on the study, she had increasing oxygen needs. She developed multiple pleural effusions. She was Cachectic. She was intubated over three times in over six weeks with a rapidly declining performance status, and she was having uh, less uh, nutrition as well. And this young uh, patient was initiated with Blue 667 at 400 milligram once a day dosing. And given that her lungs were all fibros, we didn't have any uh, specific target lesions. So the, the patient's response is still a uh, stable disease. Uh, as per resist version 1.1. But we could see the dramatic symptomatic response in this patient. The oxygen was weaned to room app within five months. And the baseline BMI, you see the scans here. Uh, the baseline BMI, you see the scans here and the asterisks here, the baseline BMI steadily increased from 14.8 when she started the clinical study to 22.3 after six months on study. And you can see uh, in the CT, the, the, the subcutaneous fat that, that also developed with increased nutrition after six months on treatment. She remains on treatment, 3.5 years. She started college, she completed college, 
very motivated patient and now is searching for a job. In fact, she reached out uh, to for a recommendation letter for a job. And you know, again, these are the stories uh, for our early phase clinical trials. This is what wakes me up uh, to go to the clinic in the morning to see such dramatic responses. You know, cancer is a challenging disease, and we are still working hard in the back end with these new drugs. Again, we are always you know, emboldened and inspired by the thrill of success. And what puts us down is always the agony of failure. But you know, these stories give us motivation to do more work with specific uh, targeted therapies and herald the world of uh, you know, era of precision medicine and next gen sequencing. Finally, uh, before I finish, one, one other case. You know, this was a 66-year-old man with poorly differentiated thyroid cancer. His tumor harbored NCOA4 fusions. Interestingly, um, his, he, he had a tough time breathing and a, trach in a tracheostomy tube was placed. And a liquid biopsy was obtained in this case, which showed an NCOA4 fusion. And given the previous responses in other patients, we started this patient on Prozatinib at 400 milligram once a day dosing, and patient achieved a deep and durable partial response with uh, Prozatinib with 94% shrinkage of the target lesions. Again, at first disease evaluation, the infiltrative mass that surrounded uh, and compressing the upper uh, thoracic trachea lost definition and decrease in size. The superior metastinal lymph node also decreased dramatically from 1.6 to 0.6 centimeter just in eight weeks of treatment. Through treatment, the thyroglobulin antibodies reduced from over 1,400 to less than one, concurrently also showing complete clearance of NCOA4 red fusion ctDNA. So uh, what did the NCCN guidelines uh, update show now? So the th for thyroid cancer, for papillary thyroid cancer, harboring red fusions, positive tumors, a selective uh, TKIs, prozatinib and selprocatinib, are being included in the NCCN guideline uh, subsequent to the FDA approval of both these agents. In follicular thyroid cancer, patients with bone metastasis and CNS metastasis, uh, prolcetinib is included in the NCCN guidelines. And again, in follicular thyroid cancer uh, with harboring red uh, fusion positive tumors, prolcetinib has been included. With bone metastasis and CNS metastasis, again in follicular thyroid cancer, same thing with Hertel cell ca cancer. NCCN guideline now include patients uh, to receive cell per catnip or in for patients with red fusion positive tumors. Again, same thing with bone metastasis and CNS metastasis. Again, uh, prolcetinib has been uh, included in the NCCN guidelines together with the targeted therapies, uh, expanding targeted therapy armamentarium that is uh, on, uh, upcoming in uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer. Again. As you know, anaplastic thyroid cancer is one of the most uh, lethal thyroid cancers or cancers known to us. And the first ever approved targeted therapy uh, for this was dabrafenib and trametinib. Uh, and, and, and with the histology agnostic approvals, uh, and, uh, in like loratrectinib and trectinib, uh, we had more uh, aid, targeted agents uh, as options for anaplastic thyroid cancer. And more recently, we have two selective rate inhibitors, not one. Uh, approved for uh, thyroid carcinoma with red fusions. Uh, so in summary, prolcetinib as an oral dose, um, once daily dosing showed potent and durable clinical activity. Efficacy uh, in this group was maintained regardless of red genotype or previous treatment history with a manageable safety profile. And again, uh, these observations support prolcetinib as a potent therapeutic option for the primary systemic treatment of red mutant medullary thyroid cancer and red fusion positive thyroid cancer. And based on this early data, prolcetinib has been FDA approved in the USA as once daily oral convenient therapy for red mutant medullary thyroid cancer and red fusion positive thyroid cancer, in addition to being included in the NCCN guidelines. I'd like to thank all the patients, their caregivers, their motivated caregivers for traveling long distances, uh, even during COVID times for the participation in the study. We thank all the global uh, study investigators and their support staff at the participating centers and the independent data monitoring committee. This research 
was supported by Blueprint Medicines, and I'm supported by NIH grant, and also an Andrew Saban Family Foundation Fellow at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, in addition to additional support. Please feel free to contact me. This is my email, bsubaya at mdanderson.org. I'm also available on Twitter, and my Twitter handle is at Dibek, B-I-V-E-K, S-U-B-B-I-A-H. Thank you so much for the wonderful opportunity. Dr. Sabaya, thank you very much. That was just absolutely spectacular. Um, you covered a lot of territory in your lecture, and so um, I, I want to thank you for um, putting that together. Um, I have several questions. I'd like to sort of start initially um, on the ground level with respect to um, strategies for using um, prostatinib in thyroid cancer, and then maybe go up to 10,000 feet and talk a little bit on agnostic approaches to uh, treatment of multiple um, different um, uh, um, cancers. Um, so in, in patients who had breakthrough on, um, MK, on after MKI therapy, was there a difference in terms of the degree of response or the durability of the response as opposed to those who were naive to the MKIs? So as you can see, we saw responses in both treatment naive and treatment refractory patients. But as you also saw, you know, in treatment naive patients had a deeper response earlier in the disease course, and uh, and you know the the duration of response is not reached in both the cohorts, so we 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 won't know. But you know, again, patients benefited from. Uh, uh, being not on multi-kinase inhibitors, especially in the treatment naive cohort. So the safety, you know, again, uh, uh, the better quality of life issue with a better selective drug, especially with, uh, you know, diarrhea, rash, and less hypertension, um, you know, when we compare with MKA, uh, as, if a patient has a red uh, positive tumor, uh, we, I, I think personally, we should, you know, start uh, with one of the selective red um, kinase inhibitors as opposed to a multi-kinase inhibitor, especially if we know um, at the outset that the patient's tumor harbors a red alteration. Is there um, any thought of doing biopsies on persistent for patients who have had radiographic partial response um, to assess whether or not there is still persistent viable disease within the um, uh, radiographic changes that suggest that maybe uh, that there has been a partial response to know if you've got um, viable cancer there? Yes, I think, you know, we there were some patients that had an on-treatment biopsy mainly because, you know, we wanted to figure out if the, it was progressing tumor or not. Early in the phase one study, we had on-treatment biopsy to show red pathway inhibition. And, you know, as I showed earlier, with uh, downstream red pathway inhibition was, was clean. And even with these uh, selective, you know, best selective targeted therapies, as you can see, we achieved complete response only in a handful of patients. And again, uh, what we see is uh, viable tumor, you know, at, at, you know, when we do a biopsy, even in patients who achieve a partial uh, response. The thing is that it could be because of um, uh, multiple issues like the, the co-occurring alterations and also uh, you know we, we will learn you know again we expect to you know completely block uh, RET here uh, as evidenced by calcitonin dramatic calcitonin reductions and once we stop the drug we see a rebound increase in um, you know calcitonin and, uh, and, and other tumor markers as well so uh, I, I think post biopsy we do definitely see viable tumors and you know, all the more reason to think about other ideas and and other um, how to go after these uh, these these tumors uh, in in the future with um, combination therapies. Great. And and what are your strategies or your thoughts in terms of those patients who um, will break through or have less than complete responses here? Um, do you have uh, do you have second line therapies that would you switch somebody back on to an MKI if they um, do fail um, uh, therapy with prostatinib? 
Uh, that's a good question. I don't think so because these uh, selective RET uh, trials are new. I don't think so. We have data in terms of switching them back to uh, multi kinase inhibitors. We are waiting on the data to see if, you know, starting a patient on selective RET inhibitor, if they progress our breakthrough, adding an MKI. Uh, would, would benefit these patients. You know, we know vice versa, it's true, but we, we, we still don't have any data the other way around. Um, can you talk a little bit about those patients with um, advanced locally aggressive medullary thyroid cancer um, who uh, you treat? Is it um, similar to the strategy with anaplastic thyroid cancer? Is there an effort or a thought about um, consolidative surgery when you get a response uh, to prosatinib in order to get a more durable local um, control of the disease, or has that not been a part of your strategy here? So, you know, this clinical trial was done in advanced patients, you know, patients with advanced thyroid cancer with multiply metastatic disease, because this is an early phase clinical trial. Now, post FDA approval, I think there are neoadjuvant uh, strategies being done. In fact, one of my colleagues at MD Anderson is running a clinical trial with a selective uh, RET inhibitor in a neoadjuvant approach. Uh, we, we start the patient on, uh, if the patient's tumor harbors a RET alteration, we start the patient on a selective RET uh, TKI and, you know, then they go for surgery, clean up the surgery, and then they go back on, on the selective RET TKI. So, um, hopefully in the next year or two, there will be more data in this in this space. Great. Can you talk a little bit about, um, uh, just from a more, um, from 10,000 feet, the uh, multiple different organ systems and histologies where RET um, alterations have been identified. Um, is there a difference across different um, organ systems. Uh, most of the people um, on this call will uh, and listening are honed in on thyroid cancer. But in terms of the other organ systems from lung, colon, salivary um, with RET uh, mutations, are they responding the same, uh, ex the same way as uh, medullary or advanced papillary thyroid cancers? Yeah, that's a great question. So again, moving to the next question of tissue agnosticism. So what we see is red fusions uh, we see in 2% of lung cancers and 10 to 20% of thyroid cancers. And in addition, red fusions are also seen in a low frequency of increasing number of diverse cancers that include pancreatic cancer, salivary gland cancer, spitz tumors, colorectal cancer, ovarian cancer, myeloproliferative disorders, and, and multiple tumors like cholangiocarcinoma. And what we've seen is red fusions uh, are uh, a tissue agnostic uh, target. And we've shown earlier at ASCO, uh, the data from pralcetinib showing a 53% uh, objective response rate in red fusions across um, multiple tumor types. Again, uh, the data set was less than 30 patients. Uh, red fusions are extremely, extremely rare when compared to other fusions. So I think we are accruing more patients to the study. And in AACR last year, we showed that sulforcatinib also showed uh, close to a 50% objective response rate across multiple histologies that included pancreatic cancer, xanthogranulomatous tumors, all harboring red fusion. So I think red fusions are, are tissue agnostic targets. And I think that's what we look forward to, uh, like the NTREC story, is that uh, you know we will see the du durability of response and the length and breadth of response across uh, multiple tumor types. The ARROW study is still ongoing for patients with multiple tumors, all solid tumors, other than uh, thyroid or lung cancer that harbor the effusions and that alteration. So the data is being actively collected and patients are being enrolled as we speak. Great. Um, and can you, uh, do, do you have a, um, an estimate or if you have hard data on the number of coexisting targetable mutations with a RET mutation that might be candidates for multi-drug um, therapy at the outset? 
So we don't, you know, that data on this study is still being collected and it's ongoing. And that's a great question. What we've seen uh, in the era of multi-kinase inhibitors is, you know, CDKN2C by fish uh, was also a co-occurring alteration seen in middle thyroid cancer. We see um, uh, activation of the PI3K, AKT, and mTOR pathway activation. So we even we designed a study with uh, Van der Tilde and Everolimus that was an investigated study. But unfortunately, you know, it was, it was challenging to dose uh, both these agents. And you know, I think the future uh, agents, as I said, uh, we we you know that that doesn't seem to be a common uh, pattern of co-occurring alteration. The co-occurring alteration pattern seems to be diverse. But one thing is that. With selective red TKI, such as pralcetinib, uh, patients who harbor a red fusion or mutation do respond deeply and achieve even complete response, even with co-occurring alterations. So the response is irrespective of the genotype and the co-occurring alteration. So in the future, we are looking forward to more data on the co-occurring alteration in terms of the progression-free survival and the overall survival, and if we can add additional agents to impact uh, the co-occurring alterations and extend uh, survival and the PFS in these patients. Great. One final question here. Um, in those patients with partial response, um, uh, was there any escalation above the 400 milligram uh, per day dosing in an effort to get a more complete response, or did you get um, an additional um, uh, adverse events when you get went above the 400? The 400 uh, milligram was the you know maximum tolerated dose because the thing is that when we went above uh, 400, above above 500 or even 600, I think at RET and the Vega Part 2 KDR are similar, and I think at 600 it starts to tickle the KDR Vega Part 2, so you know patients start developing hypertension and and other uh, multi-kinase related side effects. So again, the tolerable dose here is like 400 or once a, once a day and in some patients you know who have a very huge burden of disease sometimes we start up we start low and and and, and go up to make sure that they don't have uh, they don't experience tumor lysis syndrome so um, here i think 400 is the recommended phase two dose and going up may just add to the toxicities and you know we don't know if there is any additional benefit to going up on the dose Great. Dr. Sabaya, I want to thank you. Uh, it's been um, an incredible educational experience. I want to thank you for all the work that you've done and the patients that have benefited from that work um, and just encourage you to keep going. Um, you're uh, impacting um, uh, so many patients across the globe here. So thank you very much and uh, stay safe down there. I hope that things get better in, uh, in Houston and the rest of Texas. Thanks once again. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and honor, and thank you for the invite. And, and thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.